Good morning. Good morning. Or should I say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be unto you and his blessings too. I will not go in further detail, uh, otherwise I'll be speaking in my language and you will be keeping silent. I am Stephen Masood. Of course, there was a time when I was not Stephen Masood. I was called Masood Ahmed Khan. But I can relate to something behind me. You can see it says frontier. I come from the northern frontier region of Pakistan. <laughs> so when I saw this word frontier, and I said, yes, thanks be to God, who sent all these Gideon uh, uh, Bible spreaders into that country too. I will talk about that a little bit later. So I come actually from the east. Uh, this lady on my right, uh, my dear wife, she also comes from the east. The only thing is she comes from Maine. <laughs> Can you imagine? God has these strange ways of people plucking from various places, bringing them together. And the scripture talks about it. We both have this ministry called Jesus to Muslims. and. Uh, her work is to reach Muslim women, mine is to Muslim men, but uh, there are other areas of it too, so please tell them what we do. Yes, and um, our ministry is twofold. Not only to reach Muslims um, directly and indirectly through various uh, ways, satellite programming and websites and um, and other other emails and so forth and and sit down meetings with uh, with Muslims as well but we also um, more importantly equip you the body of Christ to reach Muslims with the gospel and that is because of what your brother said when in he, he introduced is because um, Muslims uh, have a law in their Re religious ideology that, uh, called Sharia, and it says that apostates should be killed. So when they know that he's a former Muslim, they really get angry and they don't want to talk, they shut down, etc. That's why it's our responsibility. And the sad fact is that 42% of the non-Christians in the world are Muslim. And only 1% of the evangelizing efforts that are going out to the lost go to Muslims. And we have a lot of work to do. So that is what our ministry helps you to do. We come alongside you in various ways. Um, we can give you the answers to their questions, their dilemmas, et cetera, through uh, different ways. First of all, Stephen is not only a speaker and a teacher, gifted teacher, but he's also a writer. So we do seminars, and that's where he does the teaching. And we have various uh, DVDs out there um, for, with his teachings on them. Um, but he's written books, and his testimony, full testimony, uh, is in a book called Into the Light. And I'm just giving you a visual because we have a book table set up out by the front door. Please come and see us after um, church, and we will um, help you there. Uh, and then he has a, a, a follow-up to that book. You'll read in that book about his friend, who is a Muslim, who remained friends with him, even though he became a Christian. And that is highly un unusual. Therefore, he's written a book called More Than Conquerors, and you'll find out how, the kind of questions that that Muslim friend would ask him as a Christian. So you know how other qu Muslims are going to ask. And find out what the destiny of that Muslim was as well in that book. One of the main um, objections that a Muslim has to coming to Christ is they believe that the Bible has been corrupted by us Christians and the Jews. And so Stephen had to write this book 
to overcome that, and it's called The Bible and the Quran, A Question of Integrity. He proves the integrity of the Bible in this book and then turns around and points out the errors in the Quran, which only a scholar in the Quran and all their traditions, their books, um, would be able to do. And he does, he's studied all of them. So he knows what's in their books. He knows what's in Sharia. So he's a wealth of knowledge. You need to get information from him so you can understand this thing um, so that we can dialogue with Muslims. Um, and then he's written a book that I love. It's called Jesus or Muhammad, A Question of Assurance. And we also have a small group study with this book. It's 12 chapters. There's DVDs with that small group study, 30 minutes of Stephen teaching on each chapter that goes with it, and a workbook for you to question yourself, and the, even the answers come with it. And along with that um, as well, uh, there are a couple of DVDs, and then there are the 14 evangelizing leaflets in which um, the, are the main objections that a Muslim has. So those are all individual as well as in packets out there. And th if you understand these objections that a Muslim has to Christianity and you study them and then let the Holy Spirit lead you which one is appropriate for that Muslim in that conversation at that time. And it's always going to be get different as the um, Holy Spirit leads. Um, some of the DVDs look like this. And on the back are this, the subjects that it covers. Some of them are just one subject. Um, and then... We also, um, I also wrote my testimony growing up in Maine in an ungodly home and um, dealing with the American culture, the lies that I believed and how I came to Christ and then how God divinely put us together. I mean, you see how far away we were? 2005 is when God brought him in this country and we've been married 14 years this year. So... That's, sorry, that's called Wedding Preparation for Eternity, A Woman's Search for True Love. Um, and then we have uh, a sign-up board out there for you to sign up for our newsletter. Stephen and I write a newsletter every two months to educate you further on Islam. And um, you just sign up on the board, and we'll send those to you free. And there's several of them out, out there to pick up. There's business cards. There's prayer cards. Please pray for us. Um, this is a very controversial ministry. We desperately need you all to um, come behind us, at least in prayer. And uh, we appreciate um, and look forward to seeing you at the book table at the end. Thank you. Yeah. I have been praying about it again and again, and especially one coming from a world where several languages are spoken, but English is too far away. My mother tongue is Pashto, then Urdu was medium, and then a lot of years were passed, and I arrived at age 30, and then I had to learn English language. So the first time when somebody says to me, Stephen, what's up? I quickly looked up. <laughs> Coming from a literalist and also parabolic country, that was my situation. Well, we like here in the West uh, things to be given to us, uh, kind of like give me the top line or gave me the bottom line, and that is it. But we Easterner talk in parabolic way, even teachers, by questioning and all that. And so all that understanding, my mind sometimes goes in a very strange uh, direction. Anyway, the subject uh, this evening, or this morning rather, yeah, there is the evening somewhere. This morning, I thought is God said it, he did it, and the remaining, he will do it, but the ball is in our court. 
Did you hear me? What a long title. We are living in a society or even in a world where this word, G-O-D, is becoming an embarrassment for people. God. When we talk about fake news, there was the fake news already started in Genesis chapter 3 when the devil said, bringing the doubt, did God say that? And the world now has reached in this, please don't mention that name or that word God. And you put here in the West that God, the other way around, they love it very much. Spend millions and billions of dollars on, God, on dog food. But you flip it the other way, that God, who is our real creator, we are living in a world that it becomes an embarrassment. But thanks be to God that there are really many people today who believe in God. But then they go into another extreme about that God to make this God as they want to, or they want to see him. Well, that's not the scripture. When God said what we refer to is the scripture we have our, in our hand, the criterion is the Bible for us. You know, in our daily life, we have standards. We go to a gas station, and there is the measurement seal by an inspector telling you that, yes, this pump has been tested. That's their criterion. You go to a bank, and you will never be accepted as bringing a dollar note and telling them, today I feel like that this is a $5 note. There are standards to be followed, and that's what is happening. Thus, God has a standard as well. So when it comes to the spirituality of our lives, both are together, whether social, economical, all these are together, and it, got, it starts with God. And that is my story. The story of you, me, and all of us. That yes, God created everything so good, but then as it is mentioned in Genesis chapter 3, something happened. And you already know what happened. Yes, paradise was lost. But God who created the whole universe through his word, whom today we know Jesus the Christ, God appointed a time that through this word, Again, the world has to be restored. And so as the time went on, yes, he sent all this guidance through the prophets, but then he sent his own son, Jesus, his own word into this world to, becoming, to become the living life for you and me, who was always the living life, and the living word of God. This Jesus about whom Moses said that God will raise another prophet like me and you should listen to him. And anyone who would not, God himself will require of him all that account. Why did he not listen? Fast forward, of course, the time of Isaiah comes and he refers to this son of man and son of God at the same time. As the time continued further, Jesus appears on that exact time. And this Jesus, when he started his ministry, he knew, although some people today say that Jesus was sent only to the Israelite, and it was that silly man by the name Paul who brought 
this so-called gospel to the other people, to the Gentiles. But Jesus was never sent, never meant to be like that. I'm not sure which Bible they read. If we leave everything, here is Jesus telling the Jews, if you had believed in Moses, you would believe in me because he wrote about me. But that was not it. He told his apostles, and it's in John chapter 10, verses 14 to 16, and he says in these words, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Did you hear? There are other sheep which are not of this flock of the Israelites, whom I have to bring to thus the Gentiles, because now God was going to open the doors, not only for the Israelites, but also for the Gentiles to come in. Now, fast forward. This is the same John who wrote that gospel. Now he writes Revelation. And when we reach Revelation chapter 7, and verses 9 to 10 says something like this. After this, I looked. This is now his vision, his revelation. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So there is the prophecy and prediction by Jesus. And there is the fulfillment even John saw. How is he going to do it? Well, there is the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mostly Christians would know the end of Matthew where it says, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. Thus, you go into all the world. And the rest of you already know that. And of course, there is the promise. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. But that's not just in Matthew. That's not just in Mark and even in Luke, but also in John. In John, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I sent you. That's the way it is done. And here my story begins. I was about 13 years old. Somebody else mentioned the word, that number 13 earlier as well. In this world today, 13 is seen uh, not in a very good way. But anyway, here I was. My country, Pakistan, was in a turmoil. Agriculture was almost lost. People had big problem in the northern frontier region because of agriculture. And so there were people who came from America and also from Canada. Not only they brought the food packages, but also brought the portion of scriptures. Well, people were in line. My friend Ahmed, and I were also in line to get the food package. When his turn came, of course, he got the Gospel of John, Yohanna ki Injil, in the Urdu language. It was about 35 th pages. And, but when my turn came, they had finished all the scriptures to give to people. And so the food package was with me, but not the Gospel of John. We arrived at his home. And he, as usual, his mother liked the food package, but as soon as she saw the Gospel of John in his hand, and she said, is that that Injil, the Gospel? He said, yes, give it to me. And she was about to throw it in the fire to burn it. She liked the food package, but not the spiritual package. 
I was quite horrified, and I said, Auntie, please don't do that. I will have it. And she said, OK, but I don't want to see it here. I took it home. There are times when parents are very much concerned about their own children, but they don't care about other people's children. And sometimes it works very nicely. <laughs> I took it home, started reading. I loved stories. And I was quite surprised. This Jesus was different than the Jesus I knew as growing up. Now, you could be surprised if you don't know about the Islamic religion. Yes, Muslims help their children. They send them to Friday school. Yes, they have Friday. You have Sunday school. And in this Friday school or madrasa, these children from six years or even lesser than that learn something about God. Yes. I believe in God, I believe in his angels, I believe in his prophets, and I believe also in the prophets and on the day of judgment. And of course, there are other things as well. But when it comes to the exposition of those words, we as children were told, yes, God sent Moses with all these books, the Torah which are in the Torah. And God sent David with the Psalms, and God sent Jesus with the gospel. And of course, there were other prophets too. But these Christians and Jews got together. They corrupted them, so God had to send another prophet 600 years after Jesus, and his name is Muhammad. And he brought the book called the Quran, thus intact, and the word of God. Now, in that Quran, of course, there are about 90 passages, nine zero passages about Jesus. And in this, it says, yes, he's the word of God, the spirit of God, but that وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا سَلَبُوهُ They did not kill him, nor crucified him. Thus, Muslims have this story that God actually took him up to himself, and then one day he will come back. And then they have these traditional stories behind it that when he comes back, he will establish the kingdom of God on this earth, which they call the United States of Islam. And when that is established, then Jesus will later, Mary will have children and will be buried next to Muhammad's grave in Medina. There are other Muslims who say Jesus has already arrived as John the Baptist was Elijah, the founder of the Ahmadiyya movement in Islam, is Jesus in spirit. So you see this confusion around the world, even among Muslims. But what is the truth? Well, that when I was reading that this Gospel of John mentioned that, yes, Jesus was crucified, and then he rose. But that did not very much impress me. What impressed me was that it was saying that God was our father. Did you hear me? That God is our father. Well, I had not a very good example in my family of the fatherhood, like many in the West are facing as well. But my father had married several wives, uh, according to the Islamic religion, and he had some other relations. We were 15 brothers and sisters, and of course there were other relations and children around us. We were told that they were our brothers and sisters as well. But this God who is our father, why was I shocked about it was because the Quran gives all that attributes to God which, which Christians gave. But one thing they refuse, that God is not our father. However, to make sure, the next day I asked my teacher, 
he was my Islamic studies teacher, and I said, sir, can God be our father? And he was quite shocked. He turned around and he says, where did you get this idea from? And I said, oh, I have this gospel of John. <laughs> I said, come with me. And he took me home and showed me the whole Bible he had. All the four gospels were there. You know, having a Bible in your home and, of course, even studying it, sometime, if you do not study it as it should be, it could create a problem as well. Because if you study something before making your mind up and then try to find things in the scripture to discredit it, you have already made up your mind. And so he had already made up his mind. He said, we believe that only one gospel was given, but these people have corrupted it. Look at these four gospels. See how technical he was. Now, you know and I know what is the gospel. But in his case, he was so literalist that he was looking at the four narrative as four different gospels. And there he was. And regarding my question, he said, and Masood, that was my first name. My full name was Masood Ahmed Khan. Ahmed Khan was the family name. You know, like you have a lot of Johnsons and Smiths. There are many, many Ahmed Khans. Many, many Khans. And so he said to me, haven't you memorized chapter 112 of the Quran, which has only four passages or four verses? And one of the passage which says, God beget it not, nor he is begotten. Lam yalid walam yulad. And I said, yes. Because by 13, I had memorized the whole of the Quran and didn't know much of it because it was in a language which I did not speak. So, of course, I said to him, oh, I do see that God beget it not, nor he is begotten. How can God have a son when he has no wife, he asked me. And it is in the Quran. The Quran clearly says, how can God have a son when he has no wife, no consort? He took me home and took that Gospel of John from me and was gone. And I was left with nothing. You know, there are times you do things for the Lord thinking the person will follow Christ right there and then, and it happens, but sometimes it doesn't. You distribute a lot of literature and don't see any result in your life. Today, you got, some of you, the Gideon piece of paper, and you know on that, Isaiah references mention. God says, the word that goes from my mouth will never return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire. And here we think about hopelessness in our lives and in other people's lives. And he says, I am in control. You do what I have told you, and I will do what I would do. And that's what happen. Just two years later, at age 15, I was given a Gideon New Testament. I still remember it. It was a blue cover, and also this jar was made on it, and it was again in my language. I thank God for those translators who took the initiative to not only translate it, but also then distribute it. And thank God for those. I didn't pay for it. Somebody like yourselves took the initiative to support that, and it reached me. But I had my own problems as well. Oh, yes, we all may hear the truth, but may our own problems may overcome sometime. We think they overcome. Like uh, Christianity, Islam is also divided into many denominations. There are two groups of Islam on the top. You know, we have Catholics and Protestants, and they, are, they have two as well. One called the 
the Sunnis, 85% of them, and the other are Shia, and then they are divided into groups. The group I was growing up would be like the Jehovah's Witnesses. See? The Jehovah's Witnesses. And as the Jehovah's Witnesses have problems and others have problems, I was told, oh, you are a member of a Muslim community which are not really good Muslim. And so I used to question, I said, so, but I want to be a good Muslim. And that struggle in me started to go on a kind of a sprint line to check for myself. And so at age 17 or 16 and a half, I will say, I left home, or rather other circumstances, you can read the book, what happened. And 500 miles away in the south port of Karachi settled. I admitted myself, or the Lord somehow helped me to get into an Islamic uh, seminary. I will call it Islamic cemetery. We also have a lot of seminaries who are becoming cemeteries even in Christianity. So in this Islamic seminary, not only as a working student, I started learning about Islam. I became a Sunni Muslim. You know, I wanted to follow the Quran and Muhammad to the letter. I wanted to be a missionary. So this four years degree I started, and it was there that as a working student working for the Pakistan Postal Services in the Censor Department, and also here now working at the Darul Uloom or the Islamic Center or the Islamic uh, uh, Study Center, I now was asking a lot of questions as well. Why, when, where, and how? You cannot be a good salesman if you don't know about your own product you are selling. And so I said, yes, I want to reach people for Islam, but I want to know what it contains and what it says. And I would say questions like these. When would I know that God now loves me, that I am in the safe zone. Now you may say, what is this? Well, God has already created some for hell and some for paradise. And I used to ask this question, so why does this God send 124,000 prophets into this world to lead people into the straight path? Doesn't make sense. When it came to God is loving and kind, yes, all these attributes, he's merciful, he's beneficent, he gives all this food, rain, and every, everything. But he's not our father. And as for as his love, oh yes, he loves us. But his love is conditional. See, when people speak your language, or present to you your Christian vocabulary, ask them further questions. So what do you mean by that? When you say God is love, a Muslim may say, yes, God is love. But what they mean is that his love is conditional. The condition is that it is I who have to take the initiative by keeping the commandment he has given by following Muhammad and then, in turn, he would love me. And I said, when would I know that? That I am in that safe zone. Oh, no, you don't. You continue obeying him, loving him, and all that. And on the great day, on the day of judgment, God will tell you. So you will see a lot of Muslims, when they talk, they will say, inshallah, if God wills. Yes, it's a very good expression. Even in the book of James, it is mentioned that when you do certain things, say that, that if God wills, we will do that. But there are other important things about our life destiny that he has already willed. He sent Jesus into this world to die for you and for me. And now the ball is in our court by believing in him. We have the promise we have the eternal life. 
Very simple, very simple. But I didn't know about these things. Then I will come across something like this in chapter 16 of the Quran, verse 61. If God was to punish people for their wrongdoing, he will not leave one soul. Where do I fit in? As the time continued, you know Islam is a work-related religion from morning till the evening. All these prayers you perform, like our Jewish friends. Jewish friends have morning, afternoon, and then the evening, but Muslims have five prayers. And all these in these prayers, whatever is said and done or given, people have to do that. And as the time continued for me, in my final year, I found that against the Quran, there are other books to be followed as well. You know, our Jewish friends have, what is that book called? The Talmud, the interpretation, the tafsirs, the exegesis of the Torah, and what the rabbi says and all this. Muslims too have those books as well, but they call them the traditions of Islam or what Muhammad said, what Muhammad did, ahadith, sunnah they will call it. How Muhammad was seen doing certain things, how he said certain things or commanded, and they have to be followed. And in my final year, as I was studying those things, at one place I came across, and these books are treated as second to the Quran, the first hand authority. And in that book it said, Muhammad said to his people, Listen, by your works, you will not enter into the paradise of God. And people asked him, what about you, O prophet? And he said, not even me can enter the paradise of God through my works. Unless God covers me with his grace and mercy. These two words, grace and mercy, fadl, and Rahma, these two Arabic words stuck in my mind, so how does one get that grace and mercy? And I was told, no, you have to continue. On that day, you will know. See, as we Christians believe, God already revealed his divine mercy. The ball is now in our court to accept it. They still await for that day. So what's the problem? Islam says, it is the same God who revealed to Jesus or who revealed to Abraham, Moses and all this, now has brought Muhammad and the Quran. Why there is a problem? As a few days continued, so all these things were happening. There was war between India and Pakistan. And like anybody else, I was afraid of death. And as I was uh, reciting portions of the Quran, that's what I had. And at one time, I said, wait a minute, what I'm reciting in my mind. And the verses were, these Quranic verses were like this. I believe in whatever was revealed to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Ishmael. And I also believe in Wama utiya Musa wa Isa, whatever was given to Moses and Jesus. And then it said, La ahadim minhum, which means I do not make any distinction among them. And I said to myself, or like someone in my mind quarreling with me said, hello? Why? Because as a Muslim, I believe that whatever Moses brought and Jesus brought are corrupted. They are not reliable. Yet the same Quran was saying to me that you should not make any distinction among these books. So when this raid was over, I started reading my Quran and in this Quran said, There is guidance and light in it. What kind of guidance and light about the Torah, about the gospel? Let the people of the gospel, i.e. Christians, judge by what is revealed in it. And then the Quran also said, In other words, his words cannot be changed. So how is it that we Muslims believe that at one time the Torah and the Injil all these were word of God, but not anymore. And yet, the God of the Quran says, God's words cannot be changed. Nobody have the audacity to do that. Well, I went and got the Bible again. 
It was given to me free of charge. Somebody like yourself paid for it. Thinking that there is life in it. And as fast forward, I don't have that much time, but I will share this with you. That I was reading, one day I reached the Gospel of John again. And chapter 1 I'm reading, and I reach verse 17, and it says, The law was given to Moses, but grace and truth came through Christ. Ah. So on one hand is Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, and on the other hand is Jesus. This, the prophet of Islam says in the Quran, I do not know what will happen to me or to you. Even he is waiting for his fadl and rahma, grace and mercy on the day of judgment. He says, I don't know what will happen to me. And here is Jesus who in the scriptures again and again say, I know where I come from. I know where I'm going. Believe in me and you will have eternal life. So where would I stand? Where would I go? To make the whole story short for you here, I decided to follow the real GPS. <laughs> and so, see, it would have not happened. Yes, God sent his messengers and his own son into this world. It would not have happened if I had not been given the scripture in my hand. It would not have happened if those people who had not translated it into my language. See how God uses. So when you do certain things for the Lord, don't start thinking it's not going to benefit what will happen to it. I thank God that somebody like you did that. And so as the time continued three years later, you know, it's like a, a beggar finding food and then tell other beggars to where food can be found. Oh, yes, they tell it. They tell it. If not, just go to uh, the south of the border, I mean, uh, uh, through, and you will, you will find, go to India and give a few pennies or a few uh, dollars to one person and see what happens to you. Uh, there will be a lot of other people asking. You know, even in Islam, uh, among the Arabs, it is said, if you find in the desert water and you don't tell other people about that water, you have committed the greatest sin on this earth. What about the eternal water? which we fill ourselves and overflow. But why don't we let other taste it too? And I thank God that somebody did. Well, three years uh, later, my parents asked me to come home. My father, <laughs> by this time, he had become a drug dealer and a lot of other things had happened, but he was still a practicing Muslim. Quite ironical, isn't it, that is. Anyway, I come home, and there are these people waiting for me. Even the Muslim imam is waiting for me. And my father asked me this question in front of these people who are jeering outside, apostate, murtad, murtad, he's an apostate, qatal kardo, kill him, and all this. Well, honor killing is just a, a normal thing because the, according to the Quran and the tradition of Islam, these things are said. And I was feeling, I could hear that, I was feeling very strange, like the peace of God was on me, but I felt like, you know, when you have flu and you have taken some Benadryl and you are just totally empty mind <laughs> and somebody else had taken control of you, well, that Benadryl is actually the Holy Spirit of God. And so that was happening in my case. So my father said, what was wrong with Islam that you left it? Of course, he spoke it uh, in Pashto language and the something like this, kya kharabi thi 
And I said, I'm sorry I cannot answer that question, what was wrong with Islam, that I left it. Never answer a negative question, otherwise it will be taken as negative from you. Find something positive to answer. And I said, I will share with you what was better with Jesus that I followed him. And I mentioned about grace and mercy, and it was quiet. And all of a sudden, my father said, hmm, you were born yesterday telling us about this grace and mercy. I still smell the smell of those diapers from my hand. My mother, there were ladies on the other side of the curtain. My mother shouted, you never changed his diapers. <laughs> My father was so red in his face. He said, woman, be quiet. There are men talking here. Well, and the next thing was a whole flare up. I was, uh, to make the, further the story for you, I finished up sitting on a donkey with a black face. They had already performed my funeral. My father had disowned me. I'd signed. I was left with Masood. And now my father, carrying guns and all these other things in that part of the land is just nothing. But carrying a sword, something is going to happen. My father was about to chop my head off in front of all these people. And they are holding on to the donkey. And I'm sitting on the donkey. And holding on to its mane, that all of a sudden, this donkey acted like a horse, kicked a few people, and this circle around me parted. And the donkey took off into the field, then into this uh, dry stream, and started running. And I'm hearing this noise, which is going away from me, saying, where is he gone? Pankaro, Pankaro, catch him. Where is he? All this. And I looked behind, now for my life I'm running, uh, the, the donkey's running, and I looked and there was this fog rising behind me. And they were on the other side of the fog. <laughs> Nothing to do with me, but I can understand that God can talk to Balaam's donkey as well, and can give that. And so, God saved me at that time. Dear friends, I have no idea why in the book of Acts we read that James were taken by Agrippa, and right there and then he was killed. God did not send any rescue. His time had not yet come. And then, a few days later, when Peter was nabbed by Agrippa again, now he is in prison awaiting, and God sends an angel to rescue him. Yes, a day is coming when we will know why God allows all these things. But our eternity is secured. That's the main question. One may live today because to one, less is given, less will be required. And to whom much is given, much will be required. He will ask us on that day, I gave you these three days, what did you do with it? Or I gave you 68 years or 70, I'm 68 years old now. A lot of things have happened in my life. Another three years were gone because I wanted to finish my education. In the, at the university campus, I was abducted by four members of the university, and they drugged me and buried me alive. The thing is that Muslim bury their dead, Muslim bury their dead before the sunset, so they have always ready-made graves available. And in this grave where they left me or buried me, now here with the drug influence that's wearing off, and I didn't know where I was. And what happened was that all of a sudden, in that feeling, I kind of heard rambling noise, and the next thing was I was in the water, floating. What actually had happened, 30th June 1977, 
A monsoon rain came from the Indian Ocean to the Karachi city and rained so much that this graveyard, which was at the foothill, on the top there was a water reservoir which broke as well, and that water rushed down and took me out. Now, here in the middle of the night, I'm saying, oh, what happened? But now I remember what they had done because the fog kind of cleared from me and all this. And then I said, but why am I floating? I can't swim. And I was almost going down that realized there was a tree branch it was a 300 years old banyan tree and pushed myself in. Now, just think about, I was so upset with this God, like Jonah was upset. And so I was so upset that I left that and uh, went home and then went straight to the university. Now, just think about it, dead man walking. And so here I was. And these four students also came out with a group of people from that particular study. And when they saw me, two ran away. The other one just plopped. But this fourth one started uh, saying, it was not me. They made me do it. And all the people wanted to know. I stood up and I preached brimstone. <laughs> you Muslims, you do these things because your prophet was like this. But I believe in Jesus because he on the cross said, Father, forgive them. But one thing was quite clear. You know, sometimes God gives us message and we mix it. But God still works with it. And I shared with them God's grace and mercy and assurance that I would have died there, but I know I would be in the paradise of God. What about you? Are you sure about it? Are you sure about it? Think about it. And I pushed a few people and came out of there, went home, and I was quite upset with God. We do that. Oh, yes. Read all the Psalms and you will find. But then there is the answer. Yes, the night is terrible, but there is good morning coming. Yes. And so as I was looking down, evening came, and I was looking down, and all of a sudden I felt you know, there are people, they say it doesn't happen today. It happened in the first century. Oh, no. Dreams, visions, and his presence can come upon you, and then you have no return. You have no return. You have to ask him. Why would Jesus say, seek and you will find? Ask and it will be given to you. Why can't? If according to it is his will, he will grant it because he knows more than us. We know this much. He knows that much. And that's what happened. And I realized that what the Lord wanted to say to me is that I let this happen to you so that you will not hesitate, but tell it as it is. It is time we are living in a time that we have to tell it as it is. Let us not be going from one direction to the other, not to be People are going to one extreme to the other. That, oh, yeah, God has totally finished with 1.8 million Muslims now. Oh, no, God has not finished yet with anybody until the moment comes. He is still waiting for people. But who would go? Why, the prophet says, blessed or beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Why? I am so glad here that today I'm at this frontier church. Your frontier is not only this church, but outside. Your own Jerusalem, Judea, and then the world. That is what we have to do. We have to share the gospel with others. If nothing else, just pin it on the scripture because the scripture says so. I have no problem with you, my Muslim friend, but the scripture says, Jesus said, I am the way, the life, and truth. 
No one can come to the Father but through me. That is all I can share with you, my Muslim friend. That is what. To finish with, to finish with, my Muslim friends, pray five times a day and recite the first chapter of the Quran and there is a verse in it which says, Ihidina Surat al Mustaqim. Oh God, show me the way. And Jesus has the answer. He says, I am the way. A Muslim would say, Ihidina Surat al Mustaqim. And Jesus says, Ana huwa Surat. I am that way. Muhammad couldn't do it. My great apology to all my Muslim friends, but even the Prophet of Islam says, I don't know what will happen to me or to you, but this Jesus says, I know where I come from. I know where I'm going. Believe in me and you will have eternal life. That's all, my brothers and sisters, I can share with you that you and I have the responsibility to share that, not with our own might, but with the might of his Holy Spirit and his word, pin it on this scripture. And thank you for helping Gideons to take the scripture. May God bless you. Thank you.